Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to those of you not only in church, but also those in joining us on Zoom and those watching the service on YouTube. I hope that you will enjoy the fellowship of worship with us. We welcome Reverend Alistair McLean, McLeod, sorry, and someone else. <laughs> this time with loud. Uh, back into the pulpit, it's good to know that he has regained his voice. As previously intimated, having moved from COVID level zero to below zero, there is no longer a legal requirement for social distancing of one metre. However, there is a recommendation from the Church of Scotland that congregations should continue to observe this for the next few weeks. We would be grateful if you would do so. There will be an extraordinary session meeting on Wednesday, 25th of August, to discuss papers issued by the Presbytery of Fife. Session members will be issued with fuller details in due course. Coffee and tea will be available in the church hall after this morning's service. There will, though, be restrictions. A one-way system will be in operation. The emergency exit has become the new normal exit, and refreshments will be served to you at table. Face coverings can only be removed for the purpose of eating and drinking. We hope that this will not prevent you joining us for a socially distanced chat. <coughs> may I recommend you that remind you, sorry, may I remind you that the congregation is now permitted to stand and sing during the services. If you choose to sing, please remember you must still wear a face covering. In order to mitigate the increased emission of droplets because of this change, for added ventilation, the fire door will be kept open during services. On leaving, please leave your hymn book on the table in the vestibule. The hymnaries will be sanitised before the next use. Finally, please do not leave your seat until invited to do so. These are all the intimations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm accustomed, by the way, to being called MacLeod, MacLeod, and all the kind of when I get phone calls from abroad, it seems. So you're, you're forgiven. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be happy in it. We sing number 399. Uh, my song is love unknown, but we're omitting verses 3, 4 and 5.
Let us pray. Loving Father, we are together in the name of Jesus, who risked so much and suffered so deeply because of your love in him. Through his faithfulness, we know how utterly trustworthy you are, and we know ourselves to be your children, safely carried, securely sheltered, equipped for sacrifice and trial. If we suffer and are afraid, if pain and trouble become too much for us, if we despair, you will be there for us, even in our darkest, deepest time. When life sparkles and all is delight, all is laughter and success, you will share our joy. And in those many days when there, are neither, when there is neither great sorrow or great joy, we can still greet you as Father every new morning, so that whatever happens, good or ill, strong or confident, with Jesus Christ we will stand, and we will stand together. And now a prayer of confession. Father, we are so weak, such slaves to ourselves. We hurt each other time after time. We wonder what comes over us. We cannot help ourselves. Our words are said and things are done that fill us with self-hatred. Teach us through our own helplessness to understand and forgive the words and actions of other people too when they offend us. God our Father, hear our prayer. As we pray now in the words that your Son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Paraphrase 61 is hymn number 424, Blessed Be the Everlasting God. We sing together.
Now hear the word of God. his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scriptures says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? And from verse 29, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable, just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. And we continue to read uh, in the Gospels, Gospel according to Matthew, um, <coughs> chapter 15 from verse 10. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth is what makes him unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what makes a man unclean, but eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. This is the word of our Lord, thanks be to God. Thank you very much. We can always believe in the words of Jesus Christ, but there is a paragraph there that I have to draw your attention to, which we're going to, to not deal with this morning, but it says, if you eat with, not without washing your hands, that's okay. Not anymore. Wash your hands and <laughs> sing the national anthem and all that kind of stuff. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's sermon I've entitled, Have You Ever Really Felt Desperate? Have you ever felt as desperate, for instance, as the Canaanite woman in today's gospel? Emotions seem to explode from us when we're desperate. We've all seen pictures on the television of men and women wailing over bro and broken with grief over their children slaughtered in a bomb attack in the Middle East. My friends, watch out for more of that as yet to come. They often collapse in unbearable pain over the bodies of their precious children. We have also seen almost desperate happiness. Again, emotions physically explode in tears and dancing 
and laughing when the almost hopeless situation turns out to be right and good. Remember the flood of joy and relief when the football boys team were, who were trapped in a grave, a flooded grave, were rescued. It was so different from the desperate sadness of the families who heard their loved ones had, had died in the senseless killings perpetrated by extremists. Desperate situations seem to make an outward show of emotion acceptable. When we were supposed surprised by events, by, by death, by new life, by rescue, by fear, we let ourselves go. Usually others around us or those witnessing an event on TV understand why people are suddenly acting differently. But isn't it interesting that we can also feel just a touch uncomfortable with a show of other people's emotion. How often have we heard the words, oh, get over it, or keep a stiff upper lip, <laughs> keep a stiff upper lip, or don't cry. After all, it was only a dog. Somehow our Western culture especially has evolved to a place where keeping uh, keeping it all inside seems to be the best best action. We don't want to make people uncomfortable, even when we are being torn apart inside. Listen to the disciples in the gospel reading today. Go and send her away. She keeps on shouting at us. The Canaanite woman was shouting. She had a very sick daughter. What loving parent can bear to see their child in any kind of pain? And this woman was desperate. She was desperate enough to break many of that culture's rules concerning encounters between men and women. She shouted not only at a man, but at someone who was special. And she knew he was special. But she not only shouted, she threw herself at his feet when he didn't answer her. She risked such a lot by doing that. But she not only did that, she argued with Jesus too. She put herself in danger of severe consequences. Her desperation overcame her fear. Her concern for her daughter made her emotional. It's easy for us to say, yes, yes, good for her, but what we might have to, what we might have wanted to say if we'd been there might have been something different. Remember, we're not now part of the culture that was, that was around at that time, where the culture was that men were, were, men were the leaders, men, men couldn't be argued with. It didn't matter what position they had, there were always streaks above, above women. Some of it's all gone wrong, but um, that, that's how it was then. What might we have wanted to say if we had been there then? Jesus, uh, Jesus isn't as good as good old helpful self today. Just been teaching about how people should relate to others. He was then very cleverly trying to stick to those Pharisees who commanded the people to keep every law fastidious, while they themselves were, remember Jesus saying, like whited sepulchres. Some Pharisees were less than good examples to their people, leading fairly self-centered lives, while demanding other people live very controlled lives. So Jesus is saying, it's much more important to consider how you use words how you speak to others, how you praise God, than to think only about what you put in your mouth. What comes out of your mouth either builds up or tears down. And God bless good old Peter. What do you mean, he asks. Jesus reminds him that what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. To the Jew, the heart is like life. What we say can be life-giving, what we can say can be destructive. And this isn't news to us. 
So we see Jesus being very frustrated in this passage. His followers don't seem to understand. That wasn't their culture. The Pharisees who were trying to trip him up were deliberately just not getting it. And so we'd imagine that when he got the chance to demonstrate, Jesus would immediately be helpful to this woman. We are surprised when at first he ignores her and then seems not only to ignore his own teaching, but he is rude to her. I was only sent to, to deal with the lost sheep of Israel, he said. <coughs> what? Isn't the second great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself? What are you thinking about here, Jesus? Jesus said so himself. Several things are going on here, we realize. First, that Jesus doesn't seem bothered that the woman is shouting. It's the disciples who are uncomfortable. It's you and I that are uncomfortable. They don't want to be bothered by an emotional woman breaking the rules. Neither do we. Demanding help too much. Jesus makes no comment about all of that. We certainly can't presume ever to know what was going on in Jesus' mind at that moment, in that position in time. But perhaps this is an example to us that her emotion and desperation were perfectly understandable and proper. What Jesus seemed to point to is his own mission. He's done this kind of thing before. Remember when his mother approached him at the wedding at Cana and said, there's no one left. And Jesus says, why are you telling me? It's not quite my time, I'm not ready yet. She was bringing his mission ahead of where he ought to be. He is, he is first mindful of his mission to the Jews, the first of God's chosen people. And this woman is pushing the boundaries. She's a, a Canaanite, not even of the family. Like Jesus' own mother, this woman knows he can, he can help her. Jesus very well may have been impressed with her persistence, and he pushes just a bit. It's not fair to throw the children's food to the dogs. How typical of that time. The Canaanites were considered less than respectable by the Jews. They weren't even good enough to be alongside dogs. But is, is it typical only of that time? Here's another lesson this passage teaches us. How have we considered the other in our own cultures? If we're honest, there are those we consider less than dogs today. But this man, unlike the Canaanite woman, wasn't desperate. Her desperation makes her fearless. Even the dogs get the crumbs from the floor. A Pharisee might have slapped her down for that remark, but Jesus seems finally to get by his own frustration and see her as a woman in need, as a woman of faith. And once again, he expands his mission and breaks down a barrier to accept and include a non-Jew. This is a big step for him. Matthew is showing us how Jesus' mission and his ministry is growing, tearing down centuries of old boundaries and opening up the culturally identif identified family of God to all God's people. In both instances, Cana and the, the need of this woman, Jesus responds to the marginalized. In these cases, to women, but there will be many more, the blind, and the crippled, the crippled in body, the broken hearted, those who are struggling with their own mentality, outcasts of all kinds, every one of them, every last one of them was welcome at Jesus' side. Our first reading reaction to Jesus' seeming rudeness is turned to an understanding of what he, he knows is happening. Jesus seems to enjoy fearless people 
who aren't afraid to engage him on a human level of love and emotion. So what can we learn about ourselves here? Several things come to mind. The obvious lesson is to ask ourselves, who do we accept as our neighbour? Do we still harbour in our hearts signs of racism? Who do we think of as less than dogs? Living in our current culture of fear is hard. We're bombarded with images and words coming out of some of our own leaders' mouths that put the fear of others into our minds, if not our hearts. Jesus might remind us what comes out of our mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. Last week another lady contacted me. She had a 12 year, 11 or 12 year old son who had been outgoing and very, um, very clever. He still was clever, but he was struggling at school and his personality seemed to have changed and he became fearless. And the more I spoke to her, the more it became obvious that this boy was um, listening to what was going on around about him and he was sensitive to what he had and that terrified him and he was scared that the world was going to come to an end because of global warming, warming and because of what we did do and hadn't done enough for. And that final advert that seems to be on the television every minute of the day now I think it's an American-based uh, advert, and there's a young man, a young boy, comes on and says, I'm only 11, what do you expect me to do about it? Get on with it, do something. And this is what came and struck him in the face. We have to be very careful how we talk to children. They're vulnerable, and they're like sponges. Jesus might remind us what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. Today we have a lot to think about when we consider this. Another thing we might learn from today's passage is a simple thing. Emotions are a gift to us, a gift from Almighty God. We might consider how we react when we're faced with either our own or with others' expressions of emotion. Do our own cultural boundaries cause us to keep it all in and, and expect others to do the same? Can we imagine ourselves ever allowing someone to share a real depth of emotion with us? Or are we too quick to shut them down too? We're missing something if we don't allow ourselves to be free, to be free to, to express ourselves, to say I love you with all my heart. But on the other hand to say, you've kind of let us down, but we'll talk about it. The Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama offers this wonderful saying, the more you are motivated by love, the more fearless and freer your action will be. And this is exactly what Jesus shows us today. Would that Jesus would say to each one of us today, great is your faith. Great is your faith and so great is your love. Let us pray. Keep us in your fatherly love so that we may never despair of ourselves and never stop reaching out to each other mercifully as you have reached out to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal Father, out of the treasures of your glory, grant us the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we may grasp the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of your love for us and find ourselves at last complete and perfect with you and all creation. 
of this through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now a prayer of intercession. Our prayer of intercession. Let us pray. You, God, are the father of every family, and all our love depends on yours. You have created us to be together, male and female, young and old. Keep us aware of each other's beauty and truth. Keep alive our mutual delight. Help us to greet each other as persons, to be appreciated as whole human beings, having mind and spirit, as well as bodies to be cherished. Don't let us be afraid of what we are. Make us glad to be men, glad to be women, glad of the differences, and aware that your image in us is male and female together. We pray for single men and women, and those who are widowed or divorced, that they may feel no humiliation or inferiority in being alone, but may be properly proud and glad of every opportunity to give friendship and affection. We pray for the well-being of women in a world where many are still exploited and still looked on as inferior. Let there be proper feminine pride and opportunity, but let us not lose the joy of the holy difference between the sexes. Let us go on enriching life and revealing the glory of human love until your purpose is fulfilled in humanity brought to the full stature of Christ. We pray for children. May they not be possessed, but nurtured toward freedom to make their own choices, discover their own truth, and go their own way. We pray for families that they may not be possessed, but nurtured toward freedom to make their own choices, discover their own truth, and go their own way. We pray for families broken by divorce or death, and for the children of those marriages. Let there be forgiveness and love enough to overcome the hurt and loss. We pray too for families broken because of the firm commitment of one member to truth and good as he or she sees it. Save all such families from bigotry in their responses to each other and from any exclusiveness which condemns without thought. Give to those involved strength and courage to bear the hurt and a love that goes on loving even when love is not returned. Let none of us be afraid to speak the truth as we see it and to take up the responsibilities of the faith, even if it means going on ahead through dark and lonely ways. Loving Father, once again, stability in the Middle East and indeed the rest of the world is parlous. The Taliban has regrouped and is fighting on many fronts. Lord God, Ordinary folk look on, anguished for the people directly affected, for sometimes that is all that can be done. Children in Libya, orphaned, sometimes abandoned, are dying for the want of basic food and medical care. It is truly heartbreaking to see innocents live and die like that. Lord, help us to try and find a way to help improve the daily lives of all those we see that are in need and inspire the governments of the world to take a more concerted effort to look after all children who are the future. Make us true brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, those who do your will, whatever the personal cost. Keep us true, keep our hope and faith and love alive so that we may be worthy of the family name with Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. We bring our service to a close, singing hymn 356, Meekness and Majesty. The tune is This Is Your God.
God loves you. Go from here in peace and in very great joy to love and to serve him and to serve and love one another. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of you now and forevermore.